my name is Stephanie Hurley, and I'm an assistant professor in the Plant and Soil Science Department at UVM. Uh, my background is in conservation and resource studies, landscape architecture, and design. So, okay, Burlington specifically uh, has a street grid that is mostly oriented either perpendicular to the lake shore or parallel to the lake shore. Um, and the perpendicular streets tend to run downhill, which means, like in many other cities, a lot of our infrastructure is buried beneath the street network. And as the streets are one of the main sources from which water runoff is produced, um, that conduit of the slope down the hill becomes really challenging and problematic. A natural watershed, what was here before the city of Burlington, um, would absorb the runoff that it wouldn't even really necessarily be runoff, maybe a little bit of surface slope, but mostly water would go from rainfall into the sky into the ground and be infiltrated to varying degrees depending on the soil type. You put in a city like Burlington or many other cities and you sort of seal the surface of the land and if you have a slope the water that hits the sealed land surface, the impervious areas, sort of builds momentum going downhill and velocities increase, flow rates increase, um, a lot of erosion results at the lake shore as well as upstream within the urban watershed. Um, it's not something that's insurmountable in terms of design to slow the water down, but you would need a design response that intersects with the water in lots of different places instead of right before the water goes into the lake, taking all the volume that emanated from upstream areas. Yeah. Well, starting with Burlington, there's sort of the idea with best management practices focused on stormwater infrastructure is to do one or more of the following. Never let the water become runoff in the first place, like conserving natural areas to the greatest extent possible, um, minimizing building footprints, paved areas. Uh, if we have to pave and develop and build, and it has to be impervious, um, doing what you can to slow down the water, uh, then basically store it in the landscape to release it later downstream. Uh, either infiltrating water underground into the groundwater or through evapotranspiration um, using you know, plants to basically get the water into the atmosphere. Um, and then there are sort of these systems that filter on a linear scale so the water keeps moving but it's getting filtered on the surface or in the subsurface by plants and soils. Um, so you want to slow the water, you want to infiltrate the water um, you want to treat to remove pollutants, which typically is done using plant and soil based systems as opposed to just large holding ponds, which let some pollutants settle out but any dissolved pollutants stay in the water column. Um, so thinking about those broad sort of like what would a designer do, some of the techniques, and you can see examples in Burlington, um, are uh, rain gardens or bioretention areas. Rain gardens is more the common parlance and there's a great example actually right at the bottom. Um, at the base of College Street, right by Echo Lake Aquarium and the Leahy Center, um, and there's a bus turnaround, and the whole interior sort of teardrop of the turnaround is one big rain garden, and that's a really nice one. Also, uh, my project on UVM's campus is a bioretention rain garden laboratory. Um, it's actually just outside the building we're sitting in right now. Uh, there's a couple other kind of key examples of uh, infrastructure like that around campus, but. Uh, we have eight different rain garden cells and we're doing different experiments to understand them better. Um, another type of uh, hard surface but that allows infiltration is porous pavement, sometimes also called porous asphalt, porous concrete. There is an example also not far from the, the rain garden at Echo, um, down at the bottom of College Street. There's a parking lot and a kiosk to the right on that waterfront area. and the area where the cars actually park is porous concrete or porous asphalt. Um, the driving lanes are the traditional blacktop, but there's areas where the cars park and there's not that much traffic. Um, so porous pavement is a great BMP that can be used in the right places in Burlington. On campus at UVM, there's a couple of uh, bike racks and a few little parking pads you see around campus that also have that technology. Um, similarly, green roofs. Um, we have several on campus. There's actually one I can see from here on the top of the Aiken Center. Um, there's also on the other side of the Davis Center, which are both out the window from my office, um, that is over some of the structure of the building. Um, 
and it's essentially a, it feels like more of an outdoor park space, but it is a green roof because of the building underneath. Um, there is several examples at the Burlington Airport, uh, at the Heritage Flight Center, and at the airport itself on the parking garage of two more green roofs that are in Burlington um, that all have, basically amongst all these four that I just named, and there are more, um, all have different plant palettes, so different choices of plants. That means that the runoff from the roof is slowed down, allowed to have evapotranspiration and filtration mm -hmm. before it even hits the ground. Um, also at the airport there's more porous parking. Um, and then you do see around town detention ponds, retention ponds, constructed wetlands, mostly of a smaller scale. Um, South Burlington on Potash Brook has a big detention pond. I like those less as BMPs because they're typically very steep side slopes and they're fenced around the outside and you can't use them as sort of a, an amenity. Yeah, that's a, that's a common concern. There are designs for cold climate porous pavement systems um, and if you have the right underlayment treatment and the right sort of drainage subsurface. Porous pavement is not just what you see on top, it's like a layer cake of different materials and different void spaces to hold water. Um, there's a great example uh, in a new development of porous pavement that's on a very sandy surface and they're getting complete infiltration. There's one at the airport that's like that and you can actually look at the surface in the winter and where the pavement is porous, there's no ice building up on the surface, and where it's it's not yeah. in the parking lot right beside it, there's ice, and the parking conditions are really bad. So there are there is definitely evidence that it can be done in cold climates, but it has to be designed properly. Yeah, um, and that's one of the reasons I was talking about you know the driving lane versus just where people park, where the cars just sit, versus where there's there's more uh, fast traffic, more vehicle movement. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I wouldn't rule it out yet. And it's both the design and the installation that can be installed incorrectly too. So yep. it works, but with the caveat that it has to be done right. Um, some of the other things, like I think rain gardens fit really well in cities and you can have many very small ones as opposed to one big treatment system. And one of the benefits of that, many, many dispersed uh, bioretention systems, rain garden systems, is that the you, if you have a problem at some place in the system, you still have all the rest of them that are working. If you have a problem with a one big giant detention pond, your whole system is flawed. So you can, instead of uh, putting all your eggs in one basket, so to speak, with bigger infrastructure, which there is rarely space for in the city anyway, um, having many dispersed systems is really important. Um, and I should actually mention that ECHO has a, a new rain garden on the waterfront. So the one that is in the bus turnaround is owned by the city, but, but ECHO actually has one right up against the building between the building and the water. It's a really lovely and educational installation. Yeah, i um, happy to talk about my project. I have a bioretention laboratory at UVM. It is uh, mostly run through uh, plant and soil science in the Rubenstein School and funded by Lake Champlain Sea Grant. Uh, at least the first four years or so of funding, and we're now in the second year. Um, and I have a PhD student who is working on the project as well as numerous undergraduate interns uh, who have been helping out with uh, laboratory research. And it's kind of an indoor-outdoor situation where most of the analysis is done inside in kind of a traditional science lab setting. But outside we have eight different bioretention cells, um, and they're all the same size, and there are three variables amongst the cells. Uh, of the eight cells, two of them have a different plant palette, and six, so six has one and two has another. The, the two are the low diversity plant palette with just two species, um, switchgrass and uh, daylilies, and then there are seven species of native plants in the other six. Um, and so we can do some comparisons. Uh, every, every treatment in the laboratory has a replicate, so there's at least two of every, every treatment. Um, so we can do comparisons between how the vegetation survives, how uh, vegetation health, how it might relate to water quality, vegetation biomass. Um, and then we have actually a climate change based precipitation simulation where we have for every pair um, uh, of cells, we have 
another pair of the cell is identical except the bioretention cell that it is paired with receives more runoff and more rainfall every time it rains, which creates uh, more intense, uh, more, f more high volume rainfalls that we would expect to see during the growing season in 50 years according to different climate models. Mm -hmm. So uh, we can compare kind of ambient existing conditions with a, pers a prospective future situation where we have a yeah. lot more rain coming in, a lot more runoff coming in. Um, and so we've got this sort of climate treatment simulation. And then a couple of the cells have this proprietary material called a layer of soil media three inches deep that is meant specifically to absorb phosphorus. Um, we've included it in two of the cells to see how the more traditional soil material will compare with this very um, kind of high-end uh, lens of additional treatment. It's sort of almost a scrubber at the end of all the other layers above um, that the water will infiltrate through. So in our research lab we are measuring water in each cell and water out and comparing water quality between the inflow and the outflow. Um, and we're also measuring greenhouse gases and partnering with uh, Carol Adair from the Rubenstein School, another professor. Um, and our, our graduate student is uh, Amanda Cording, she's a PhD student, also be great to talk to her. Um, and they are more doing the climate piece where I'm doing with Amanda the water piece, um, but essentially looking at something that's not that much studied in this field, the climate change component of how these systems fit in is discussed as well, they're vegetative systems, so bioretention will be more resilient in the face of climate change. But we're not looking at, uh, until now, as far as I know, most people haven't studied whether the systems themselves emit greenhouse gases. So we're actually measuring gases in the bioretention systems. And the way these are designed, um, to go into a little detail about that, they're mostly sand and gravel soil materials, so there's never a super anaerobic um, standing water environment for days which would typically release some gases, like constructed wetlands emit methane. Um, so we're not expecting to have significant greenhouse gas, but we are measuring it to see um, if they're part of the climate change solution, but if there's any problems along yeah. those lines too. Things that people can do at home. I think rain gardens are very accessible at home. I think disconnecting downspouts that are sometimes, in some cases, illegally, connected right off your roof into the city storm yeah. sewer system, you can stop that water, you can slow it down um, by having it infiltrate into your land. Uh, even if you don't have that much space between your house and the street, there's actually usually space to infiltrate some water. Um, so I think disconnecting downspouts, to an extent, rain barrels can be helpful. They can't hold that much water, but they can, um, in sort of aggregate from house to house to house, retain water and it can be reused. So instead of going downstream, you can use it for irrigation. I would say some residential locations are suitable for porous pavement materials on driveways, um, but definitely where you can fit even a small rain garden insertion in the landscape instead of mounting up your garden having it as a depression and allowing water to be temporarily stored and infiltrating within, you know, uh, from any rainstorm, usually rain gardens will infiltrate within 24 hours. Um, that can greatly help restore more of a natural hydrologic regime uh, in comparison with just water hitting the ground, flowing off, and heading to the lake untreated um, and way too fast. I think that best management practices of all kinds are going to be necessary in the face of climate change. We're already seeing the effects all around the world, um, and certainly with events like Irene. Um, that goes beyond just the developed area BMPs that I've been talking about, but thinking really about river restoration and management, whole watershed analysis where you might do different uh, things in the headwaters and on dirt roads than you would in the mid-slope areas than you would in the valleys and the floodplains, but that people need to actually insert this green infrastructure all throughout the watershed um, and try to mimic natural conditions. Natural systems are more resilient mm -hmm. than built systems in most cases. Um, also to use green vegetative systems as opposed to just you know, hardening, throwing rock and concrete and rebar up onto 
uh, shores to stabilize them. It would be a lot more beneficial to grow some plants there and let the roots do the stabilization. Not only aesthetically, but also in terms of wildlife habitat, in terms of sort of robust and fluid and flexible infrastructure instead of forcing water a certain way, letting it, letting things get wet and letting the water recede again. Um, I'd like to think that Vermont, because of the momentum of the people and the creativity um, and the, the sort of burgeoning dialogue about green infrastructure, could do really well. We also have a relatively low population densities, um, but it's going to take a lot of work and it's going to take both sort of the volunteer side of the, the goodwill implementation of green infrastructure and it's going to take regulation and top-down um, measures where it's required. It should be not an add-on at the last minute in a project, but the first thing that people think about with a new development. And in fact, with a lot of retrofits, you can almost always fit green stormwater infrastructure in if you have to. But if designers and planners and engineers aren't required to or asked to, um, we don't know what will happen. I mean, it's a completely different landscape, but if you look at downtown Berlin, Germany, there's a, an edict, essentially, that no runoff from the project can um, run off, essentially. Anything that falls as rain must be infiltrated and contained within a project site. And these are big downtown plazas and buildings and skyscrapers, and they all have green roofs on them, and they have these really cool outdoor water features. They're very sort of geometric and urban, and but it works, and they're doing this in a very dense, very paved landscape, so I think we can do it in Vermont. But, so this side of the road is the, the native species mix. Those are natives on the other side, but they, it's a much lower, more monoculture looking, it's only two species. Um, we have all the way down the road <laughs> on both sides, we have eight total rain gardens, so there are five on that side and three on this side. And over here, you can see some of the infrastructure. You can also just see how much sediment gets washed in off the road in cigarette butts. It's pretty nasty. These sort of cuts in the curb let the water in so that the water flows through these, these rock line channels. There's, the water is sampled in, at an inlet little box, a little weir here. And then the water is spread. There's a sort of a gutter system underneath and then it goes about four feet down through the sand and rock layers and gravel layers um, and comes out. So the water goes in through all these layers and it comes out about three and a half, four feet down into a, a pipe that's perforated to let the water in. And then we sample again to test the outfall runoff. So basically coming off the street, there's a little four by 10 planted by a retention cell, and we can get water in, water out. Some of the cells are then equipped with these rain pans, and the rain pans are on the bioretention cells that have a climate variable added where uh, precipitation is increased. Every time it rains, this much more water ends up in the cell, and the equivalent uh, percent watershed draining here is larger too. It's kind of a, a two-piece two analysis where the treatment has more runoff more precipitation and more runoff coming off the street. Um, and basically, we have these pairs of ambient existing conditions versus the conditions that you could expect in a climate change future. Those two cells are the different vegetation palette. Um, all the plants are native and all are known to be pretty tolerant to road salts. But we're experimenting a bit with um, low diversity versus high diversity plant palette systems. Um, but it's right here on campus, you know, it's, a, it's an area where we, we can see a lot of water generated from the road, including all the way uh, around the corner up there, and so it's a, a logical place to put in treatments. Uh, what I'd like to see in the future is similar systems all the way around this parking lot, because we can only capture the road runoff here because of the, the slopes, but there's some places the parking lot slopes towards the mountains over there, and there's definitely room in the, the grassed area to do more insertions like this in the landscape. Um, and those we wouldn't necessarily have to monitor, so it wouldn't be as expensive to build.